I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, an unexplored, underappreciated component of Grant's career. Uh, of course, we all know Grant achieved worldwide fame as a man of war, and that is how he is best remembered today. Those who are familiar with Grant the General know the sentiment that he expressed when he said, quote, although a soldier by profession, I have never felt any sort of fondness for war, and I have never advocated it except as a means for peace. There is also widespread familiarity with his generous terms uh, when General Robert E. Lee surrendered to him at Appomattox with the Army of Northern Virginia paroled, which meant in effect that they could return home as long as they didn't take up arms. Officers who owned horses or sidearms could keep them as well as their personal baggage. Uh, soldiers could take horses or mules back with them for the spring plowing. Grant stopped a subsequent attempt to prosecute Lee for treason in violation of the surrender terms by threatening to resign his commission. But there is far less familiarity with how Grant, the president, directly advanced the cause of peace in his foreign policy, which is my focus in recognition of Peace Day. On three occasions, he resisted the public clamor for war in ways that enhanced his country's standing abroad, uh, and on one occasion left a particularly profound legacy for future peacekeeping efforts. In 1868, a rebellion against Spain broke out in Cuba. During the following year, Grant's first as president, the rebels garnered a great deal of support among Americans and, in turn, pressure from Congress for military intervention on behalf of the rebels. Grant, for his part, sympathized with the Cubans and at one point even considered issuing a proclamation recognizing the insurgency using the same language that Spain had used and recognizing the Confederacy as a belligerent during the Civil War. But he also saw the need to be prudent and to hold back from taking an interventionist position unless it was in the nation's interest. In June of 1870, just as there were efforts brewing in the House of Representatives to recognize Cuban belligerency, Grant issued a message to Congress that assumed the posture of strict neutrality, arguing that Cuban insurgents had no valid claim to be recognized as belligerents. Among other things, he noted, he noted that atrocities were being perpetrated by both sides in that conflict. Quote, there can be no just sympathy in a conflict carried on by both parties alike in such barbarous violation of the rules of civilized nations and with such continued outrage upon the plainest principles of humanity. He also pointed out that the insurgents held no town or city and lacked the kinds of government functions that would make it viable. He also doubted that they had any le uh, legislature representing any popular constituency. Grant's message snuffed out the possibility of Congress recognizing the insurgency. It not only averted a war with Spain that once seemed unavoidable, it also helped to revive the influence of the presidency after it had been battered under Grant's predecessor, Andrew Johnson. At the same time the Cuban issue was brewing, the administration was facing an even graver dispute involving Great Britain, and I will dedicate most of today's discussion to that subject. During the Civil War, the British government angered many Americans with its believed sympathy with the Confederate cause. Queen Victoria's proclamation of neutrality in 1861 was viewed widely as a proclamation of Confederate belligerency since it granted the rebels the rights of belligerence. This included recognition of the Confederate flag on the high seas and equal privileges for southern and northern ships in British ports. Between 1862 and 1864, several Confederate ships were constructed in and set sail from British ports. These included the Florida, a cruiser which left Liverpool and was armed in the Bahamas, the Georgia, 
a screw steamer built on the Clyde River in Scotland and armed at sea, and the Shenandoah, an iron-framed steamer also built on the Clyde. And then there was the Alabama, which left Liverpool and took on arms from a British tender in the Azores. Despite warnings from Charles Francis Adams, the American minister to Britain, the British government allowed these ships to escape and cause a great deal of destruction to American merchant shipping. The Alabama was the most famous of these ships. The Confederate steamer would capture over 60 U.S. merchant ships valued at nearly $6 million. The Alabama finally was sunk by another steamer called the USS Kearsarge off Cherbourg, France on June 19, 1864 in one of the Civil War's most dramatic naval engagements. Lord John Russell later would confess in his recollections that the delay which prevented the Alabama's detention was his own fault as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. During the course of the war, many northern ship owners decided either to lay their ships up or to transfer them to foreign flags in fear of British-built Confederate raiders. After the Civil War ended in 1865, President Andrew Johnson charged the Brit that the British conduct was responsible for, quote, the prolongation of our civil contest and for driving the American flag from the sea. But whatever valid criticisms might be leveled against Great Britain for her role in the Civil War, in all probability, most Britons did not endorse the Confederacy. Much of the middle class and almost all of the lower class sided with the Union, and this sentiment intensified after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. In England, the Alabama's successes were accompanied by increasing popular criticism of the ministry's laxness during the war. Grant later concluded that, quote, the hostility of England to the United States during our rebellion was not so much real as it was apparent. Regardless of the British people's feelings, damage attributed to the British government's conduct regarding the Alabama and similar ships, all of which could be placed under the generic heading of the Alabama claims, left a dilemma that had to be dealt with. Since there was no clearly established rule in international law addressing the duties of neutral countries with respect to the construction of belligerent war vessels, the entire question was in a very uncertain state. Adams had proposed the arbitration of the matter to Lord Russell as early as 1863, but Russell would refuse the offer in 1865, insisting that his government had not violated its duty as a neutral. He considered Adams's theory of liability as, quote, most burdensome and indeed most dangerous to England and he felt that England would be disgraced forever if a foreign government were left to arbitrate whether an English Secretary of State had been diligent or negligent in his duties. At the time, it should be noted, arbitration was defined on a simpler scale than the form it would ultimately take. When Philadelphia lawyer Thank you. Uh, Thomas Balch suggested to President Abraham Lincoln in 1864 that the controversy with England should be argued before a court of arbitration. The president responded that it was, quote, a very amiable idea, but not possible just now, as the millennium is still a long way off. <laughs> still, after the war ended, the unsettled quarrel presented the most menacing situation between the two countries since the War of 1812. The Johnson administration's various attempts to grapple with the Alabama claims culminated in an agreement signed near the end of the president's term called the Johnson-Clarendon Convention. This provided for the settlement of all claims arising over the preceding 15 years. Now, although it mentioned the Alabama claims, it did not emphasize them or recognize the profound injury Americans felt toward Great Britain. The convention additionally made no provision for international law in the future, and the rules of arbitration it incorporated were tedious and flawed. 
One of its mechanisms allowed for split decisions to go to arbitrators selected by drawing lots, and it was offensive to the deep American sentiment surrounding the dispute to suggest that a matter of principle could be decided by chance. In April 1869, a little over a month after Grant was inaugurated president, the Senate overwhelmingly rejected the treaty. The rejection followed a bitter denunciation of it by Charles Sumner, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In his widely publicized speech, Sumner expanded the definition of national losses to a new level beyond the $15 million he estimated to derive directly from the capture and burning of American vessels and $110 million of collateral damage from driving commerce from the sea, he articulated a third category of claims. These came to be called the indirect or national claims. Specifically, he asserted, quote, that the rebellion was originally encouraged by hope of support from England that it was strengthened at once by the concession of belligerent rights on the ocean, that it was fed to the end by British supplies, that it was encouraged by every well-stored British ship that was able to defy our blockade, that it was quickened into frantic life with every report from the British pirates flaming anew with every burning ship, and without British intervention, the rebellion would have soon succumbed under the well-directed efforts of the national government. Sumner did not directly enumerate the amount of this claim, but he did point out that the Civil War cost the government over $2 billion. He alleged that British intervention doubled the duration of the war and that the simple equity of this case made Great Britain justly responsible for the additional expenditure to which our country was doomed. This went much farther than Johnson and his Secretary of State, William Seward, had ever gone in describing the damage done by the Queen's Neutrality Proclamation. Sumner was presenting a bill for over $2 billion. Now, observers clearly knew, as Sumner most probably did, that this extraordinary sum, which no one expected Britain to pay, aimed at the forfeiture of Canada. And the annexation of Canada, Sumner desired, realistically, could not be expected by peaceful means. Needless to say, large numbers of British subjects were upset. <laughs> In his first inaugural address, Grant had made it a point to declare his intention to frame a strong foreign policy. He said, quote, I would respect the rights of all nations, demanding equal respect for our own. If others depart from this rule in their dealings with us, we may be compelled to follow their precedent. The new Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, did not believe there was any sound legal basis for Sumner's $2 billion claim. He believed that time was needed to allow passions to cool in both of the disputing countries and that negotiations, once resumed, should be handled in Washington rather than through a minister in London. Sumner, who soon after Grant's election had indicated his willingness to become Secretary of State, meanwhile was engaged in a plot to take and maintain control of the negotiation process. Grant tried to foster a harmonious relationship with Sumner by nominating the Senator's friend, the historian John Lothrop Motley, to be the new minister to Britain. But Sumner had a friend, Coach Motley, to follow his view instead of Grant's. Grant sent his aide, Adam Badeau, to serve as Motley's assistant secretary of legation. He instructed Badeau to speak to the British as follows, quote, I particularly wish you to say that I am anxious for a harmonious adjustment of our differences with England. The two nations ought to be friends, and one object of my administration is to secure such a friendship. I particularly do not intend to dispute the right that England had to acknowledge the belligerency of the South. Say this in conversation constantly. Make opportunities to say that you know this is my position and that I authorize you to declare it. When Badeau repeated this conversation to Motley, he later recounted, quote, he at once desired me to say nothing on the subject in England, 
He declared that I should embarrass him greatly if I assumed to discuss political matters at all or to speak in any way for the president. Motley proceeded to make several misstatements of the administration's position, uh, suggesting that Britain was responsible for prolonging the war. At the same time, an open rift developed between Grant and Sumner over the president's attempt to annex Santo Domingo. It was largely due to Sumner's influence that the Senate defeated the annexation treaty on June 30th, 1870, and Grant asked for Motley's resignation the next day. Motley refused to resign and was recalled. The previous year, Secretary Fish had explored possibilities for the settlement of the Alabama claims. Uh, he conveyed to Sir Edward Thornton, the British minister to the United States, the desire of uh, the U.S. to establish a commission to negotiate a settlement. Thornton asked whether Fish intended arbitration in his reference to a commission, and the secretary replied, no, the commission would assess only the amount of damages. Thornton did not like this idea because it entailed the British government admitting its liability, a pronouncement that he thought should be left to another sovereign entity to make. In his first annual message on December 6, 1869, President Grant approved the rejection of the Johnson-Clarendon Convention on the grounds that it failed properly to recognize certain injuries caused by the war. The list of those injuries, which he said, quote, could not be adjusted and satisfied as ordinary commercial claims, included increased insurance rates, decreased imports and exports, its effect upon the foreign commerce of the country, the transfer of commercial trips to Great Britain, and the prolongation of the war and an increased, the increased cost both in treasure and in lives of its suppression. Although the message was apparently designed in part to placate those who concurred with Sumner, it applied broad enough terms that it did not necessarily adopt the senator's view of indirect damages. The president ended his remarks about the dispute by asserting, quote, I hope the time may soon arrive when the two governments can approach the solution of this momentous question with an appreciation of what is due to the rights, dignity, and honor of each, and with the determination not only to remove the causes of complaint in the past, but to lay the foundation of a broad principle of public law which will prevent future difficulties and tend to a firm and continued peace and friendship. The fisheries disputes constituted the greatest controversy between the United States and Canada. They were sparked by the Can Canadian Parliament's exclusion in January 1870 of Americans from Canada's inshore fisheries including the significant right of purchasing bait, salt, and provisions at Canadian ports as a reprisal for the perceived harm of American tariffs. Far surpassing in number Canadian fishermen in northern waters, the Americans reportedly had been making catches valued at a total of six million dollars per year. Now, Fish met with Thornton in September and proposed to broaden the scope of negotiations. The United States implicitly agreed to drop its demand for Canadian independence, as well as its refusal to arbitrate the Alabama claims. Britain would surrender her claim in the San Juan boundary dispute, which involved the definition of the Canadian-American border running through various islands on the Pacific coast, lying between Vancouver Island and the North American mainland, under the ambiguously worded Treaty of 1846 and she would reopen Canadian fisheries in exchange for lower American duties on some Canadian goods. Lord Granville, who became the British Secretary in 1870, grew more encouraged about the prospects for negotiation when Thornton showed him Fish's proposal. Granville passed it on to Prime Minister William Gladstone and raised an additional question, whether the fisheries dispute and Alabama claims could be arbitrated. Gladstone approved the idea, but no agreement had yet been reached by the end of 1870. In his second annual message of December 5th of 1870, Grant lamented this failure, primarily because the British government was unwilling to admit any liability towards the United States. 
He then followed with a proposal that the U.S. government take ownership of the private claims and be given authority to make accompanying demands on Great Britain. This position simultaneously returned the dispute with Britain to international prominence and gave Gladstone's government a reason to worry. The United States' assumption of control over all claims would leave Britain with an unsettling doctrine of neutrality that threatened to work against her in the face of the Franco-Prussian War into which it might be drawn. So the British government became distinctly more anxious for a settlement. With Gladstone's consent, Lord Granville prompted, uh, promptly sent Sir John Rose, the Canadian Minister of Finance, to Washington to negotiate a settlement. Rose and Fish came to an agreement that Britain would propose a joint commission, modeled largely after the commission that formulated the Treaty of Ghent in 1814, at the end of the War of 1812, uh, it would settle the Canadian issues, San Juan, the fisheries question, and some lesser issues, and the United States would propose including the Alabama claims. Grant accepted Fish's proposal, and a correspondence followed between Fish and Rose. Rose and Thornton suggested to Grantville that Britain concede liability on the Alabama question, but Gladstone's government refused, and Rose continued to, defend, to demand unconditional arbitration. Eventually, the diplomats on both sides of the Atlantic agreed that there should be appointed a joint high commission to formulate the means by which to, several, to settle several issues, the fisheries dispute and other controversies relating uh, to the United States and Great Britain's possessions in North America, the Alabama claims, the inclusion of which Grant deemed essential, and all other claims, both of British subjects and citizens of the United States, that arose out of the Civil War. But this agreement was not the end of the process for the administration. They still needed to get the approval of the Senate. And the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee presented a threat to the ultimate success of the negotiations. Sumner had flatly rejected the plan for a joint commission in a letter to Fish stating as his grounds a demand that extended even beyond the independence of Canada. Quote, the withdrawal of the British flag cannot be abandoned as a condition or preliminary of such a settlement as is now proposed. To make this settlement complete, the withdrawal should be from this hemisphere, including provinces and islands. Now Grant knew what that proposal entailed. Quote, he said, that suggestion was a de declaration of war. And as he later observed, I wanted war. I wanted peace, not war. The president would ardently support Fish against Sumner and other critics. So Grant and Sumner were in open opposition by this time, primarily due to the debate over the Santo Domingo Annexation Treaty. The senator had made what might be termed a fresh declaration of war upon the president in a December 21st speech entitled, entitled Naboth's Vineyard. The speech was so personal and vicious, including uh, a reported discussion in which Sumner claimed the president had threatened him with personal violence, that Fish and others thought he had lost his sanity. Sumner threatened to block a settlement with Britain, and Grant, supported by Fish, demanded the senator's removal from his chairmanship. In a rare occurrence in American politics, the demand was met. A Senate caucus decided to remove the Massachusetts senator, and Sumner was ousted from the chairmanship, and indeed from the Foreign Relations Committee altogether. Simon Cameron, a staunch advocate of the president, became the new chairman. A major impediment to the Joint High Commission's work was now eliminated. Had the balance of power gone unchanged, Sumner might have become a precursor to Henry Cabot Lodge, who in his later battle against Woodrow Wilson would lead the Senate in, defending, in, in uh, defeating approval of the League of Nations in the aftermath of World War I. Now in February of 1871, Grant nominated five people to serve as the American Joint High Commissioners, with Fish to lead them. Queen Victoria's five picks for the British High Commissioners were led by Earl de Grey and Ripon, a member of Gladstone's cabinet. 
The Joint High Commission began its work on a treaty amid fears expressed in the British press that its activity would harm its country's interests. Additionally, Canada complicated the challenge. It occupied a position of virtual autonomy. Its interests were more likely to be compromised for the sake of Anglo-American harmony, and it would present the strongest opposition. The treaty would be negotiated virtually by three countries, and its full effectiveness would require approval not only by the United States Senate and the British Parliament, but also by the Canadian Parliament and the legislatures of Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland. Sir John Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, had been appointed one of the British High Commissioners, and that was significant. If Canadians opposed the treaty as unacceptably compromising of their claims, Macdonald would be compelled to defend his work, and there might have been no Canadian in a stronger position to do so. The fisheries dispute actually occupied more of the High Commission's time than the other issues, but it was settled that for 10 years, Americans would have the right to inshore fishing, fishing along the coast of Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and several nearby islands. Canadians would enjoy the same rights on the northeastern coast of the United States, and the United States and Canada would transport fish oil and fish to each other free of duty. This arrangement gave far greater advantages to the United States than to Canada. So how did Fish get the other side to agree to this? By referring to arbitration the amount of payment from Canada. Grant agreed with Fish on this, provided that Britain concede the free navigation of the St. Lawrence River. With approval from the British government, three of the British commissioners consented to this proposal. Prime Minister Macdonald objected, but he was powerless to change the outcome. So arbitration provided the answer to a seemingly insoluble question. The amount America should pay Britain for its fishing privileges would be decided by an international commission in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The San Juan dispute, it was decided, would be arbitrated by the Emperor of Germany. He would choose between the American case and the British case which of these claims was most in accordance with the true interpretation of the Treaty of 1846. As for the Alabama claims themselves, the two sides negotiated back and forth until they agreed to three rules of neutrality that would be incorporated into Article 6 of the treaty. These rules bound a neutral government to use due diligence to prevent the fitting out or other preparation of vessels for warlike use and to prevent either belligerent from putting its ports or waters to military use. The American commissioners emerged from the negotiations with a strong diplomatic achievement behind them. Some would assert that the United States virtually had secured victory by binding the arbitrators to its case through the three rules of neutrality. Fish also prevailed in choosing the method of arbitration. The case would be decided by a commission of jurists rather than by a sovereign head of state, which was the British preference. The Queen, the President of the United States, the King of Italy, the President of the Swiss Confederation, and the Emperor of Brazil each would appoint an arbitrator to sit on the five-person tribunal, which would meet in Geneva. The Treaty of Washington was signed on May 8, 1871, and ratified by the Senate on May 24th. All but three Republicans voted for it, while only two Democrats supported it. Sumner, whose vote had been the subject of much speculation, begrudgingly remarked, I never expected much from the High Commission, but he voted for the treaty anyway. Parliament approved the treaty and ratifications were exchanged in London on June 17th. Canada presented the most opposition to the treaty, but John Macdonald's skillful management of the debate in the Canadian Parliament and his success in conveying the Dominion's reliance on cordial Anglo-American relations played a decisive role in securing a vote of approval in the House of Commons at Ottawa. In his third annual message in December 1871, President Grant asserted that, quote, an example has been set which, if successful in its final issue, 
may be followed by other civilized nations, and finally be the means of returning to productive industry, millions of men now maintained to settle the disputes of nations by the bayonet and the broadside. The Geneva arbitration would begin only days later. To constitute the arbitration panel, Grant selected Charles Francis Adams, Queen Victoria chose Sir Alexander Coburn, Lord Chief Justice of the, King's, of the Queen's Bench. The remaining three arbitrators, appointed respectively by the King of Italy, President of the Swiss Confederation, and Emperor of Brazil, were Count Federico Sclopis, an Italian Senator and Minister of State, Jacques Stempfli, former President of the Swiss Confederation, and the Baritone de Tajuba, the Minister of Brazil in France. The American case estimated the damages arising from the seizure, detention, and destruction of American ships by the Confederate cruisers, including increased war premiums, at about $19 million. An additional $7 million or so was estimated as the national expenditure for the pursuit of the cruisers, bringing the total to about $26 million. The indirect claim for the prolongation of the war would pose a grave threat to the arbitration's success, asserting that, quote, it is perhaps impossible for anyone to estimate with accuracy the vast injury which these cruisers caused in prolonging the war. The American case requested reimbursement for the cost of prosecuting the war after the Battle of Gettysburg, the justification being that by July 4th, 1863, the offensive Confederate land force had been crushed, leaving as the only hope for the rebels the possibility that they could delay until the British-built Navy, the only offensive force they still had, would provoke a war between the United States and Great Britain. The shorter British case did not anticipate the scope of American claims. After the presentation of the indirect claims in the, in the American case, Granville issued a letter of protest that Gladstone's cabinet had approved, insisting that the indirect claims were not within the jurisdiction of the Geneva Tribunal. Although the American high commissioners and other government officials had viewed the indirect claims as resting clearly within the language of the treaty, they did not truly believe the claims had merit. Fish stated candidly in his private correspondence, quote, I never believed that the tribunal would award assent for the indirect claims. It is not in the interest of the United States, who are habitually neutrals, to have it decided that a neutral is liable for the indirect injuries consequent upon an act of negligence. We have too large an extent of coast and too small a police and too much of the spirit of bold speculation and adventure to make the doctrine a safe one for our future. Still, Fish continued, to have omitted the indirect claims from the case would not have been fair to either party. It would have been to not submit a part of the complaint while the treaty professed and designed to remove all causes of difference. Meanwhile, the ongoing dispute incurred financial losses in both Europe and the United States. The London stock market suffered a panic and investment in the United States was almost halted. The American government grew more anxious to reach a settlement. Fish suggested to the British minister on April 27th that the U.S. would drop the controversial allegations of liability on the condition that Britain would promise never to raise similar claims against the United States in the future. Grant approved this proposal, but London's reply on May 2nd was a flat insistence that the indirect claims be regarded as non-arbitrable. Fish responded to Thornton that that practically means your withdrawal, and he asserted in his diary, under no circumstances can the United States agree. Grant agreed that the United States had gone as far as it could with concessions. Intending to establish a united front, he called Senate and House Foreign Affairs Committees uh, to the State Department uh, for a May 4th meeting that would review recent correspondence between the two countries. Grant directed Fish to send his draft letter refusing to assent to Britain's terms and added that the United States' previous offer was no longer open. 
Amid a growing sense of dejection over the apparent fate of the treaty, Fish and Robert Schenck, the minister to Britain, desperately joined Thornton in urging Granville to make some concession to save the treaty, but to no avail. After the tribunal opened its session on Saturday, June 15th, the British side maintained that it could not present its argument until the indirect claims matter was settled, and it requested an eight-month adjournment. Concerned that this requested delay might mean the end of the arbitration altogether, Adams discussed with Assistant Secretary of State J.C. Bancroft Davis, who had presented the American case, a possible way of saving the treaty. The arbitrators could summarily announce that they reject the indirect claims before reaching the other claims. Davis spoke to his British counterpart, Lord Tenderden, the Under Secretary of State, and they worked around the clock with several of their colleagues the next few days to formulate a statement that all the arbitrators signed on to. They rejected the indirect claims as lacking a good foundation to award damages and said that they should be excluded from the tribunal's consideration. Following this statement, the crisis over the indirect claims abruptly ended with approval from both governments to proceed with their arguments. A total of 32 conferences were held at Geneva, and the tribunal issued its final decision on September 14, 1872. The tribunal found the British government to have acted without due diligence, failing to adhere to its duties under the three rules of Article 6 in the cases of the Alabama, the Florida, the Shenandoah, the Tuscaloosa, which was the tender to the Alabama, and the Clarence, the Tacone, and the Archer, the tenders to the Florida. The arbitrators announced an award of $15.5 million against Great Britain. The administration in Washington was very pleased with the decision. The American Council had enjoyed about as much success as soberly could be expected. Great Britain paid the full award on September 9, 1873, and Congress subsequently established a court of commissioners to adjudicate the compensation of those who sustained losses incurred by the cruisers found liable at Geneva. The Treaty of Washington's three other arbitrations accompanying that of the Alabama claims were all settled accordingly. Shortly after the Geneva Award, Emperor William I decided the San Juan dispute in favor of the American claims, leaving the United States without a border dispute with Great Britain's possessions for the first time in its history. Only the boundary of Alaska, acquired five years earlier, remained undetermined. There were additional private Civil War claims beyond the Alabama claims that were resolved in 1873 by the dismissal of all American claims against Great Britain, while the United States was ordered to pay about $1.9 million of the approximately $96 million that British subjects claimed, the rest of the sum being disallowed or dismissed. The fisheries arbitration at Halifax resulted in an 1877 decision that the United States should pay Great Britain $5.5 million in exchange for its privileges under the treaty. Whatever the later arbitrations added to the treaty's triumph, the resolution of the gravest difficulties with Britain in 1872, in the President's words, had left these two governments without a shadow upon the friendly relations which it is my sincere hope may forever remain equally unclouded. Grant's peace legacy uh, as President did not end there. Yet another episode in which the Grant administration averted war, once again with Spain, was the Virginius Affair. 150 years ago, in 1873, the Virginius, a steamer flying the American flag and commanded by Captain Joseph Fry, a U.S. citizen, was captured by the Spanish gunboat Tornado. <coughs> Claiming that the vessel was uh, aiding Cuban re rebels, the Spanish military authorities executed 53 prisoners, including Fry and many other Americans. Resisting pressure to declare war on Spain, Grant and Fish secured a peaceful resolution of the crisis, including the release of surviving captives and ultimately an $80,000 indemnity from the Spanish government. An investigation of the matter, 
had revealed that the Virginius was illegally registered and had no right to fly the American flag. After the episode had concluded, Fish wrote a letter to his son in which he revealed his feelings about the possible war that had just been averted. He, he confided, quote, I have thought of the tens of thousands of wives who might have been made widows and of the hundreds of thousands of children who might have been made orphans in an unnecessary war undertaken for a dishonest vessel. To read these words from Hamilton Fish is especially haunting in retrospect. At the time he wrote them, he had a baby grandson and namesake who was nearly six months old. Although the elder Fish had helped avert it in his own time, war with Spain would come 25 years later. And when it did, his grandson Hamilton was killed while fighting with the Rough Riders in the invasion of Cuba a few days before his 25th birthday. For all the tragedy that lay ahead for the United States, the Grand Presidency, free of international war, contributed more than any other to the 33-year period between the Spanish-American War, the longest uh, in American history in which the nation went without the affliction of a major war. Writing in 1936, John Bassett Moore, the renowned authority on international law, asserted that the Treaty of Washington, quote, was the greatest treaty of actual and immediate arbitration the world had ever seen. And it still holds that preeminence. Besides the fact that it provided for four separate arbitrations, its greatness in his estimation stemmed from the magnitude of the questions submitted and the magnanimous and enlightened statesmanship which conducted them to a peaceful determination. The treaty has been ranked second in importance to that of 1783, which recognized the independence of the United States as a turning point in Anglo-American relations. Its success elevated the two countries' friendship to a point that there has never since been a return to the war-threatening level of hostility that followed the Civil War. In his second inaugural address, delivered 150 years ago, President Grant looked forward to a day, however distant, quote, when armies and navies will be no longer required. Soon after his retirement in 1877, while visiting England, the former president became one of the earliest world leaders to advocate the idea of a World Congress, a proposal that took an additional step from the principle of arbitration in a speech to the Midland International Arbitration Union. Now I quote, Nothing would afford me greater happiness than to know, as I believe will be the case, that at some future day, the nations of the earth will agree upon some sort of Congress which shall take cognizance of international questions of difficulty and whose decisions will be as binding as the decision of our Supreme Court is binding on us. It is a dream of mine that some such solution may be found for all questions of difficulty that may arise between nations. And Grant did not stop there. One diplomat who accompanied him during his world tour in Europe observed that he never lost an opportunity to urge crowned heads and prime ministers to adopt arbitration instead of war. The Treaty of Washington did not mark the first international arbitration by any means. Examples could be found in American history alone since the Jay Treaty of 1794 between the United States and Britain. But the Jay Treaty involved comparatively small claims and did not include charges of hostility on the part of either government. The Geneva arbitration marked the high point of international arbitration. As the first time two powerful nations settled a question of paramount importance without reverting to war, it set a significant precedent. It led to several organized efforts toward promoting world peace. This movement included the promotion of not only the idea of arbitration, but also the adoption of a code of international law, which at least would lessen the effects of war, and the types of institutions that would logically build upon the principle of international arbitration. 
The movement most significantly led to the establishment of the Hague Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes of 1899 and 1907, which established the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the Covenant of the League of Nations, and years later, the Charter of the United Nations. The participants in the Alabama Claims Settlement, while realizing the importance of their work, did not pretend that they were on the verge of abolishing all war. That arbitration faces inherent difficulties does not make the Geneva arbitration an insignificant precedent. It adds to the achievement of those who made it work, and its aftermath contrasts with that of the failure of the League of Nations. The tragedies of World War I and World War II would mar the 20th century on a massive scale, but the principle of international arbitration still survives. In the days of the United Nations, with all its travails and deficiencies, and a discernible code of international law, the Geneva arbitration has faded into obscurity even in history books, but its legacy is still with us. And if you visit Geneva today, you can still see what is known as the Alabama Room where the tribunal convened. Whether or not they are widely recognized, the lessons of this chapter of history will continue to be meaningful whenever nations facing problems of seemingly insurmountable difficulty seek an alternative to war. As many of you know, the epitaph of Grant's tomb consists of the four-word closing sentence of his letter to the Republican National Convention accepting his nomination for president, let us have peace. That became the unofficial theme of his presidency, and those words hold meaning well beyond the most familiar features of his illustrious public career. It may be most fitting to close with a tribute made to Grant several years after his death by Isaac Sharpins, president of Haverford College, which was founded by Quakers. Sharpins wrote, quote, a member of the Society of Friends, a society pledged for 250 years to a sturdy opposition to war as always wrong and never right, can freely join in words of praise for Ulysses S. Grant. He can see as plainly as anyone the grand simplicity of the man. This recognition grew with every year of his public life. His earnest advocacy of arbitration has made his later years stand for peace, and the sum of his life is a testimony for the qualities which America should always appreciate in her great men. Thank you, and I'm glad to take you. Frank, that's a remarkable amount of scholarship. Uh, that's got to be part of a book, right? Thank you for the... <laughs> so, Beth kindly... Uh, not one, but two books uh, up here for me to, uh, to plug. This first one, which is still available at the gift shop, published 1998, President Grant reconsiders, so it's right there. This is a short book that I wrote. It actually started as an undergrad history thesis. And later it was expanded to, again, a short volume that poses an argument for why historians, in the traditional assessment of Ulysses S. Grant's presidency, got it all wrong. Uh, well, 25, I can't believe 25 years have passed since this book came out. At the beginning of this year, we released uh, this volume, Grant at 200, which I co-edited with Chris Mikowski, a previous, uh, multiple occasions, a wonderful guest, uh, a wonderful uh, Civil War historian. This collection of essays, also available uh, for sale here, compiles over a dozen uh, essays from various scholars on different aspects of Grant's life and, and public career. There are several, there are probably an equal number of essays devoted to components of Grant's military career and to his uh, presidency, and that includes the two essays that I contributed. There's a long essay on Grant, Grant's presidential standing that kind of takes account of, okay, where are we in the quarter century since this came out, and a bunch of other works have come out on Grant's presidency. What have the historians gotten right? Where is there still room for improvement? 
Uh, so that's what I talk about, but that's just one small fraction of Grant at 200. The other essays will include uh, Ben Kemp, who wrote, had a wonderful contribution about Grant's uh, sad closing chapter, sad but still inspiring, and he just so beautifully brings out what Grant was feeling, the experience that he had with all sorts of people during his uh, last days. And I can't do justice to all the essays that are in this volume, but I'll tell you we've got a bunch of uh, contributors who include Gary Gallagher, who wrote an essay, the, the Fall and Rise of Ulysses S. Grant, about this very interesting trajectory that his reputation had followed. Uh, Joan Waugh, who talks about surrenders. We have Ryan Sems talking about foreign policy. Al Felsenberg talking about civil rights. Nick Sacco at another grant site at Whitehaven in St. Louis has a wonderful piece coming from Grant's St. Louis years with some new insights about Grant's relationship to his family, including his in-laws. Ron White has a wonderful essay, Son of Methodism, that explores Grant's religiosity, a subject that most biographies really give short shrift to. Uh, John Marsalek, the former executive director of the Ulysses S. Grant Association, has an essay about Grant at West Point. And we have pieces as well from Ulysses Dietz, who was a guest at last year's gala, for those of you who attended, great-great-grandson with some unique perspectives uh, from a member of the Grant family. Chris Mikowski, besides co-editing the book, also has uh, essays in, in the book. Kurt Fields, who portrays Grant, has his unique perspective from that. Chuck Calhoun, who wrote, I have this short book on Grant's presidency, but Chuck wrote, for the first and really the only definitive narrative entirely devoted to Grant's presidency to come out in over 80 years. It was a book that came out in 2017, and I would recommend that highly uh, for those of you who, who have not encountered it. It's a wonderful book, and he writes about uh, Grant's view of politics and the, some of the unique traits that he had as president. We also have posthumously published, with permission from the family, uh, a wonderful tribute to Grant by Jack Kemp. Uh, and also making an appearance uh, in here, we have letters for Grant's 200th birthday, uh, contributed by all six living presidents, as well as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Milley. So we're really honored to have them participate in the bicentennial in, in that way, and that's just an additional feature that you'll get with this book. And if you uh, uh, purchase it, by the way, I do have to give a nod to our contributors. None of them are taking royalties for this. All proceeds from the sale of this book are going to go to two nonprofits. One is the Grant Monument Association, the nonprofit that we have based in New York City that's dedicated to Grant's tomb, but also engages in other commemorative and educational activities relating to Grant. And the Ulysses S. Grant Association, which operates Grant's presidential library. Uh, John Marsalek and the then president of the uh, Grant Association, Frank Williams, the former Chief Justice of Rhode Island, and also a distinguished scholar of Lincoln and Grant. He actually writes the foreword uh, to this book, but Williams and Marsalek were really responsible for getting together this uh, collection of, uh, of contributors to make this book possible. Uh, Delays, you heard about supply chain problems and stuff like that. Well, paper shortages and supply chain problems being what they were, uh, this book covering Grant's 2022, or just reflections of, uh, during Grant's 2022 bicentennial, did not actually hit the presses until the beginning of this year. So it's still a pretty fresh book. Uh, and I, I hope that you will read it. And uh, this is the place to, to get it, to support Support three organizations if you buy it over here. Do we have any <laughs> questions from the audience? Yes. For yes. Frank? Yes. Can you um, say anything about a kind of large topic, but the successes and failures of Grant's peace policy with the American Indians? That's an excellent question, and it goes to one huge policy, one huge component of Grant on the subject of peace that was not the subject of this foreign policy uh, dedicated piece. So I'm glad you asked the, the question. 
Grant entered the presidency at a time when the country had a nominal reservation policy, but in practice, with this unprecedented westward expansion that was taking place after the Civil War and Western lands that were opened up to, there were policies that were, of course, uh, encouraging the settlement by unprecedented numbers of uh, American settlers, the Native Americans, the Indians, faced graver threats to their continued existence than they probably ever had, even through the bloody wars of, of the 18th century and before. Grant, starting with his first inaugural address, confronted this injustice, and he did so in really stark terms about the wickedness of the current policy, which amounted to allowing for wars of extermination. He did not mince words about what was at stake and saying that well, we're, we need to stand proudly before the nations of the other civilized nations, and we can't do so if we continue on this trajectory. So he wanted to change the paradigm, and this is a, a, a dense pro, uh, proposition, but uh, to break it down to its basics, Grant started out hoping to shift control over uh, Indian affairs to army officers who he knew, having been an experienced army officer, obviously, understood what it took to coexist with the Native Americans and who could really help implement treaty provisions so that uh, settlers would not encroach on Indian territory, and then also there are Indian depredations to be concerned about. There were atrocities that, that because of all of the baggage, all of the years of, of hostilities between several of the tribes and American settlers and the, and the U.S. government, Grant wanted to pursue a new paradigm in which the best interest of the Indians would become the government's responsibility. Now, Congress stood in the way of having army officers assume that new role, so Grant maneuvered around that by turning to religious ministers. As it turned out, they're all ministers from various Christian denominations to implement what came to be called the Quaker Indian Peace Policy. Uh, this was a policy that again, uh, was motivated by the humanitarian impulse. Now, to, without any uh, uh, doubt, it was an assimilationist policy. The idea was that members of the tribes would learn American Western uh, notions of agriculture and farming and uh, retreat from the nomadic lifestyle that they had operated under but the policy did wind up producing a multiplication in the number of schools, the amount of cultivated land, the amount of cattle that the various tribes had. And under a law that was passed in 1871, the entire paradigm of legal relationship to the tribes was changed so that Indian treaties were nullified, that the obligations of Indian treaties still remained, but they were viewed more as contractual obligations, while the federal government assumed for the first time responsibility over uh, the Native Americans as individuals, rather than looking at them as member, almost as members of foreign tribes within U.S. borders. So, so there was always this dichotomy, uh, and it, it, it remains a really ambiguous and complex area of American law to this day, this kind of hybrid domestic and foreign policy dynamic that you have with the tribes. Now, his aspiration was to basically eliminate uh, war, to have no violence with, uh, with the tribes. And uh, initially, it looked like that's the way it would develop. But of course, while most tribes did, did not present conflicts with settlers, there were several instances where conflicts did arise. So the Indian Wars, as we collectively call the various conflicts with uh, Native American tribes that occurred you know, for centuries, you know, long predating independence. Well, those conflicts, which were especially pronounced between the 1860s and really up to the early 1890s, although by some accounts they they went from you know the 1600s to 19 the 1920s, depending on how you count. Well, the Indian War has certainly continued, and because of the uh, the scale of westward expansion. There were a substantial number of skirmishes that occurred uh, 
we called them the Indian Wars, but they were much smaller scale in terms of the, uh, the casualties than some of the earlier Indian Wars that, that took place. But that be, it became a part of uh, Grant's record that historians debate to this day, and not always with a realistic sense of what viable policy options were in the late 19th century. On the political spectrum of his own time, Grant assumed the most humanitarian stance toward uh, the Indians of anyone. And when he was com uh, criticized for it, it tended to be because he was too apt to credit or make ex excuses or defenses for the Native Americans while, uh, while attacking a lot of the white settlers as the instigators of, of a good number of these conflicts. Uh, but he also faced, I think, the, the low point was the, the, uh, the Black Hills uh, controversy when there was a flood of settlers that encroached on this territory in violation of a treaty, and Grant just did not have the capacity to, uh, to enforce the treaty and to keep the uh, peace. He tried to find a way uh, around it, but there wound up being what's known as the Great Sioux War that occurred anyway. But an interesting follow-up to this, I do make, I have some commentary in my essay in Grant at 200 about this. Nowadays, among scholars of uh, Native American history, there is a tendency to monolithically dismiss pretty much everyone in the late 19th century, no matter what faction they were a part of, uh, for whatever views they had toward uh, the Native Americans, and that includes dismissing the humanitarian impulses because, well, they were assimilationist. How can you force the culture to adapt to a different way of life? Again, on the political spectrum of Grant's own time, this was seen as the most humanitarian approach. He did not view it as something that was heavy-handed. It was something that brought satisfaction to a good number of tribes. And just days before he retired from the presidency, representatives of several of the Indian tribes jointly sent a letter to him thanking him for his humane and just policy. And there are even some others, interestingly enough, uh, like Quanah Parker, the Comanche chief who had fought the Red River War during Grant's presidency, later becomes an advocate um, for the Quaker Indian peace policy among his own people. Chief Joseph, whose Nez Perce tribe was at war with the federal government just months after Grant retires from the presidency, makes the trip to New York City to help lead the procession dedicating Grant's tomb. It's striking to me that these living witnesses to these events that transpired in the late 19th century came away, even some who were at, literally at war with the federal government during Grant's time, came away with more support, sympathy, affection even, for what Grant had done and what he attempted to do, sometimes with success, sometimes without so much success, but they tend to appreciate this component of Grant's uh, political legacy more than I would say most historians of Native American history today do. Any other questions? I promise the next answer will be shorter than the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there's been um, quite a bit of information about Grant being adamant about not prosecuting any of the Confederate generals. But from what little I read, it looks like he actually went to school at West Point with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that yes. influenced some of it, or was it part of his whole um, propensity towards let's move on and make nice and be a cohesive nation? I think it's a combination of both. Certainly the bonds that were formed at West Point not only at West Point, but you know, during the Mexican War where he saw service with a good number of West Pointers, some of whom did not overlap with his own years at the academy, but you, you had people including Robert E. Lee who was 15 years older than he was. Uh, there was certainly a personal affection there, probably most demonstrated in the case of James Longstreet, although maybe that's a little bit uh, of, a, of an exception uh, because Longstreet had a connection to Julia's family and was apparently present at Grant's uh, wedding. Uh, 
But Grant, I think, had a general outlook that largely matched that of Abraham Lincoln, that we need, what is, think about fighting the peace, winning the peace after you've won the war. How do we do this? We need an unmistakable level of magnanimity. We can't have, for instance, mass executions. And other than the Commandant Wirths of the Andersonville prison camp, and if, I don't think you count the Lincoln assassination co-conspirators really so much in, the, in that category, because I think that was a separate uh, thing, but the, the American Civil War ended with a strikingly <coughs> strikingly high level of reconciliation, a strikingly few of the acts of uh, vengeance and, and even the level of justice that would include you know, throwing people in prison for, uh, for treason. Uh, but Grant, if Grant had thought differently, Lincoln really set the tone. Grant was not in a position to try to be non-magnanimous in, in his approach, but it so happened that he and Lincoln were on the same page, and Grant, like so many Americans, saw it as a tragedy when Andrew Johnson ascended to the presidency after Lincoln's assassination, and he had this unfortunate combination of, on the one hand, a sense of vengeance against Confederate leaders that prompted him to support uh, a treason prosecution of Robert E. Lee, while on the other hand, uh, you know, until Grant made him back down, but on the other hand, of course, opposing all of these civil rights measures that were pushed on behalf of, of formerly enslaved people.